Hey guys, back with another mushroom hunting video. This one has footage from two separate days, but very similar environments, both mixed conifer forests in coastal California, mostly Monterey pine and some cypress. These are swillus pungens, also known as a slippery jack or the pungent swillus. There's a few different varieties of swillus that get called slippery jacks. So one of the interesting things is the way the cap changes color as these mushrooms mature. They go from this kind of like olive brown color to this nice chestnut orangish color. Some of the uh, characteristics of swillus is they'll tend to have a viscid or slimy cap when they're wet. This one doesn't bruise, doesn't change color when it's bruised, and a lot of swillus, but also, Laciniums have this kind of um, stippling pattern on the stipes here. Now, it's called this, the pungent swillus because it, it has a smell, although I would say the smell is, is pretty mild, actually. Um, some of the field guides describe it as uh, fruity. I'm not really getting so much fruit off these. Um, occasionally, I'll get some that smell kind of lemony. You can see the pores here. These are not considered choice edibles. Um, their texture is generally not considered to be very good, and the cap, or the, the membrane on the cap has to be removed, or is generally removed because it's quite slimy. Um, Swillis are popular in uh, Russia, but most North American mushroom hunters tend not to eat them. I think I'm going to try collecting a few of these younger specimens, and uh, maybe I'll try pickling them. Supposedly they're good pickled or in soups. So I found a few younger specimens under some of the pine duff, and I wanted to point out some specific features of this species. The first one is they're almost always found under Monterey pines or Bishop pines, and as you can see by the duff, I'm in a pine forest. And the other one is that the young mushrooms often have these milky droplets on the underside. It's not quite a latex, but it sort of resembles it, and it just kind of exudes from the pores of some of the young mushrooms. You can see my fingertips are getting greasy and sticky with the uh, slime from the top of these caps. This was actually quite annoying. My hands were stained for almost a week straight despite scrubbing and washing with everything I could think of, including bleach. In addition to the change in color, it also changed the texture of my skin. My fingertips felt kind of smooth and greasy. When the caps are wet like this, you can see just how viscid and slimy the caps are. Look at that. These are Krugomphus vinicolor, also known as pine spikes. Vinicolor as in vino because they're wine colored. They are edible, but I've heard mixed reviews as to their taste. Personally, I've never tried them. The camera doesn't quite pick up their color. They're actually a little bit more orange than the camera picks up. This is Chlorophyllum burnaeum, also known as the shaggy parasol. It's one of my favorite mushrooms if you can find it when it's young and bug-free. There is a toxic look-alike, Chlorophyllum libdites, also known as the vomiter. Kind of self-explanatory why you don't want to mix them up. But if you know what to look for, it's pretty easy to identify. So Chlorophyllum bruneum has a white or buff spore print, and as such, the mature gills will usually be white or maybe a little bit tan whereas Chlorophyllum molybdites will have a kind of green spore print and slightly green-tinged gills when it's really mature. I don't know of any other mushrooms that have green spore prints, so that's a very easy way to identify them. Some of the other characteristics of Chlorophyllum bruneum that I've noticed, I tend to find them in mulch, whereas molybdites I tend to find in grass and lawns. 
Bruneum has very shaggy scales, especially as compared to molybdites. Bruneum tend to be quite large mushrooms, and they bruise a kind of reddish brown quite quickly. They tend to attract maggots pretty quickly, but if you can get them before the flies land on them, they're one of the best mushrooms in the region in my opinion. These ones here are pretty much perfect in terms of maturity. They're either just about to open or they've just recently opened. Really nice looking mushrooms here. This is Gymnopolis ventricosus, also known as Jumbo Gyms. It has very firm flesh. It's a fairly tough mushroom. It has a little bit of a smell, I would say, actually similar to the Swillis, slightly lemony, at least on this particular one. And the taste of the flesh is bitter, although it takes a few seconds to really detect the bitterness. The species usually grows on stumps and logs. Jumbo gyms are not edible, but there's many different species of Gymnopolis, including a few that are psychoactive and contain psilocybin. This is Amanita muscaria, also known as fly agaric. It's perhaps the most iconic mushroom in the world, and one of the prettiest in my opinion. It has many of the typical features of an Amanita, the enlarged base called the vulva, white gills, but it's very easy to identify because of its red cap with the white warts. There's a number of different subspecies of Amanita muscaria. Here in California, the most common is probably Amanita muscaria var flavio vulvata. The name fly agaric is supposedly because it was mixed with milk to attract and kill flies, but personally I've never noticed that flies particularly like it. This mushroom is variously described as edible, toxic, and psychoactive, and that's due to the presence of two chemicals, ibotenic acid and muscimol. They're closely related compounds. Ibotenic acid is decarboxylated either by the liver or heat to form muscimol. Muscimol is a GABA-A agonist, meaning it activates GABA-A receptors in the brain normally activated by the neurotransmitter GABA. GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, meaning GABAergic neurons reduce the chance that downstream neurons fire action potentials. The GABAergic system is an ancient and conserved neurotransmitter. Agonists of GABA receptors or positive allosteric modulators, which are drugs that increase the sensitivity of the receptor, include alcohol, benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium, barbiturates, and Z drugs, which are drugs like Ambien and Lunesta. These drugs tend to have anxiolytic, that's anxiety reducing, amnesic, memory reducing, sedative hypnotic, calming and sleep inducing, euphoriant, pleasure inducing, and muscle relaxant effects. Ibotenic acid, on the other hand, is a glutamate receptor agonist, specifically one subtype called the NMDA receptor. Glutamate receptors are a major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So ibotenic acid activates excitatory NMDA receptors until it's decarboxylated to muscimol, at which point it activates inhibitory neurons. The issue is that NMDA receptors are involved in a very specific process in the brain called long-term potentiation, which is the process of strengthening neuronal connections, something which is thought to be very important for learning and memory formation. Ibotenic acid is a strong NMDA agonist, and overstimulation of the NMDA receptors leads to neuronal cell death through a process known as excitotoxicity. As a result, ibotenic acid is used in research as a brain lesioning agent, inducing targeted cell death in brain tissue. Although the concentrations in these studies are much higher than would probably be achieved by eating any Amanita muscaria. All that said, ibotenic acid and muscimol are quite water soluble, so they can be removed from the mushrooms by boiling them several times in fresh water. With the ibotenic acid and muscimol removed, the mushrooms are no longer psychoactive and they can be eaten safely. Now I've done this and I found the mushrooms actually had a kind of slimy texture that I didn't really care for. That was kind of surprising because I haven't noticed that happening with other edible amanitas like amanita velosa or 
Amanita calyptroderma, but maybe I need to modify the preparation a bit, maybe by removing the membrane on the cap. As for the psychoactive effects, the ibotenic acid can be decarboxylated by heating to form the muscimol. Some is decarboxylated by dehydrating the mushrooms, and the remainder can be decarboxylated by prolonged boiling to make a tea. The resulting tea has a surprisingly fishy umami taste. My experience consuming that tea has only been with relatively small doses, and I would say it feels most similar to alcohol. Same tipsy, slightly dissociated feeling, but also with some sedation and salivation which is not unusual for GABA agonists. At higher doses of Amanita muscaria, people can experience a range of effects, including intense delirium, dissociation, sedation, euphoria, and nausea. All in all, it's a very interesting mushroom with a fascinating history in ethnobotany. I used the chlorophyllum mushrooms in a frittata. Pretty simple, I just preheated an oven to 400 degrees, washed and chopped the mushrooms, and then I cooked them in some chicken stock until most of the liquid had evaporated, at which point I added some olive oil to brown them a bit, and then in a bowl I got eight eggs and added some chopped onions, grated cheese, and the sautéed mushrooms, along with a little bit of milk. Put that whole mixture into a pan, which I forgot to grease, and I baked it for around 25 minutes until the knife came out clean and I'm pretty happy with the result. So I did end up pickling some of the Swillis pungents that I picked. First, I peeled the membrane off the cap with a knife. Then I washed all the mushrooms and boiled them in lightly salted water for about eight minutes. I made a brine with salt, sugar, vinegar, and spices, and brought it up to a boil, and then I poured the hot brine over the mushrooms. I let them sit for a couple days, and they were decent, but I wouldn't call them choice. I got poison oak on one of these trips, probably because in winter poison oak tends to lose its leaves, making it much harder to spot. If you've never had poison oak or poison ivy, it's an extremely unpleasant experience. This is my face just a few hours after exposure, and this is my face the next morning. And then several days later you get this horrible weeping rash. This is an allergic reaction known as urushiol induced contact dermatitis, and it's a type of allergic reaction known as a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, or delayed type hypersensitivity. It's a reaction to oils in the plant called urushiol, which is composed of several related compounds, which are derivatives of catechol. The long carbon chain makes the molecule hydrophobic, which is to say oily, difficult to wash off, and able to penetrate the lipid bilayer of our cell membranes. Urushiol is a type of allergen called a haptin, which means urushiol itself doesn't trigger an immune response until it binds to proteins in our body, at which point it's recognized as foreign. Initial exposure to urushiol doesn't produce an allergic reaction, but results in sensitization. Once sensitized, a subsequent exposure results in the allergic response. Unlike some other allergic reactions, type 4 hypersensitivity reactions are mediated by T cells rather than circulating antibodies. Briefly, T helper cells become activated when an antigen presenting cell presents the protein bound urushiol to it. The T helper cell then activates other immune cells like macrophages and T killer cells that lead to inflammation and program cell death as the immune system tries to destroy the perceived invader. The sensitization to urushiol can also have the unfortunate side effect of cross-sensitization, which is where one becomes allergic to chemicals related to urushiol, generally produced by plants in the family Anacardiaceae, known as the cashew family. This includes mangoes, and so cross-sensitization can lead to mango mouth, an allergic reaction to oils in the skin of mangoes, these oils are resorcinol derivatives, and you can see here just how similar they are to urushiol. The R group shown here on the urushiol and the resorcinol derivatives is that long hydrocarbon chain. There have been several studies to reduce the allergic reaction to urushiol, which would be known as hyposensitization. Interestingly, the approach is to give urushiol or urushiol derivatives either as a pill or as an injection. 
One candidate that's showing promise is known as PDC-APB, and it's a drug that I would love to see come to market. Anyway, that's all for this video. Let me know what you think about the style of mixing in molecular biology with foraging. Thanks for watching.